<laughs> All right, so good evening, everyone. So uh, thanks for coming. And uh, we are in the 13th of this event. Uh, as usual, we'll ask uh, Professor Amrish Chakravarti to come over, uh, the chairman of the department, to talk about uh, what these Silver Jubilee celebrations are. We'll start with uh, a 10 minute introduction about the department and we'll take it from there. Uh, they should, uh, you guys are seeing the screen, uh, the slides up there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, so good evening, and uh, it's that time of the month again. Every month, I hope another 12 will, will go on, right? So wonderful. So thank you for coming back. And uh, for those who haven't uh, attended this event before, and also hopefully there will be also some additions that have happened, right? So let's just go on that. It's a very pleasant uh, thing to celebrate the 25th year of the establishment of the department, so 1998. Um, let's move on. Uh, the MDES program started 26 years ago. And uh, yeah, so that's an advertisement for the building that we are supposed to uh, be able to finish in hopefully in a couple of years. Um, let's move on. OK, so we are uh, doing all right uh, in terms of our uh, research and also um, using QS, which doesn't really uh, look at the research profile for design as a category uh, yet. Hopefully that will change. Uh, let's move on. OK, so that's a very quick. I hope the numbers are numbers are changing, but uh, I think 400 plus MDES uh, people graduated. Some of you are sitting in the audience, uh, both virtual and physical. Um, also very uh, delighted, very happy that that is a sizable PhD and research student uh, community. I think this year it has surpassed the the number of uh, MDES MTech students. So that's quite something. MTech program started not very long ago, about five years now. Uh, so we have a smaller contingents there. Uh, I don't think we are now on the top in terms of the number of patents being published from our department at the moment, but then if you do per capita, we are definitely on the top. Mm. Um, and of course, awards and recognitions are, are uh, a large number. I'll show you some of the example. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so these are some of them, but these are mostly from our ex-students, although Deval Kariya is, well, he is also an ex-student, but I think when the award was obtained, he was still an ex-student, right? Yeah. But but the award was based on work that was done uh, when he was a student. So that way, I think we can claim uh, direct um, direct share of the the recognition. But also um, several others like uh, just go back um, like these Benpu and other Red Dot Award and so on are from our ex students. Um, please move on. Sickle um, <clears throat> Innovation is a very um, successful uh, startup in the agritech area, one of the best uh, agritech uh, startups. Grass Bionics is getting there. I see um, Vina is sitting right at the front, uh, and his face is getting covered uh, yeah, behind my screen, I think. Uh, go, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is probably one of the uh, latest ones. Professor uh, Satish Vasukelas has received the uh, what is the award called? He DRDO Technology Transfer Award from uh, our uh, Defense Minister at the recent uh, DRDO event in uh, May uh, for his work on friction stir welding. So that's great. Uh, well, we are just about <laughs> this is put there. So we are just about to start the first DRM Gurukul. DRM is, is a research methodology that uh, some of us were involved in developing. And it has been running in Europe for a long time and also at MIT more recently, but not in India. So we started to correct that now. So I think more than what 50 something people have applied and hopefully first week of July is when we get it started. And then it goes around into other institutes as well. All right, I think that's more or less. Okay, so we have research students around the world and you can see one sitting next 
next to uh, next to us here and uh, yeah so that's one thing why we actually wanted to start the research program um, and uh, we are we are happy that we did because you see our footprint now or head print perhaps we should call it everywhere in the world anything else okay our our vision is to pursue excellence in these two areas uh, and by bringing together all these uh, apparently disparate elements that sit in different corners functional aesthetic usable sustainable so you can create impact please go to the next slide yeah and with development of professionals leaders and products as well as knowledge yeah i think kind of covered so i'm not going to belabor the point uh, many firsts design observatory pre phd program smart factory plm conference which is a global conference now everywhere uh one of the first five to six design innovation center hubs and so on so please go to the next yeah and a number of uh, major initiatives i think dr srinivas is sitting here heading the um, the technology business incubator i think the first in medtech and geriatric healthcare particularly and then uh, several others professor uh, gurumurthy design innovation center uh, also national design innovation network and so on and also smart factory next yeah so these are conference series that are more or less established now every two years each of them each of them take their turns uh, and i think that's it no that's the last slide right and then it goes to you so thank you for listening and i'll pass on to vishal right thank you all right so with that introduction we'll get started with uh, the uh, agenda for the day uh, as uh, we always have we have uh, as i mentioned earlier but now that the audience is here uh, and of course most of you know so this all the discussions that we are having here will eventually be cataloged uh, in a coffee book uh, about design where 100 experts uh, would have spoken about uh, their views on design and we have a set of questions which repeat every time and we get very different inputs a lot of overlaps as well but a lot of interesting insights based on their own uh, backgrounds and so on so without further delay and given uh, that we have two of our presenters as usual online so we'll start with them uh, especially kingshuk because we got him to wake up very early on a monday morning uh, so kingshuk maybe we can start with you and then we can go to tane and so on and we'll follow from that so your 10 minute whenever you start sure sure absolutely let me see if the uh, slide shows up can you guys see my screen yeah yeah okay perfect so uh super quick intro because i think uh, we're keeping it short uh, my name is king shok das uh, i am based in san francisco uh, the bay area and uh, just wanted to uh, talk a little bit briefly about moving design upstream which has been one of the themes animating uh, my design journey over the last yeah. couple of decades. Should, before, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Uh, before you start, just let me read out your bio. And uh, sure. in the meanwhile, you can make it full screen. I'll keep it very short. Yeah. So Kingshuk is a design strategy and product leader based in San Francisco. From IDEO to JP Morgan Chase, he has a track record of human-centered innovations across a wide range of industries. From brain, brain surgery to breakfast cereal, and from FinTech to fizzy beverages, Kingshuk works with transformational executives. to redesign their organizations around the customer experience products services business models as well as their teams tools processes and culture so yeah with that all yours awesome um i've made it full screen can you guys see it full screen okay let uh, me see if there's yet, something not yet. My... okay i'm not sure uh, what else i can do i think uh, i'm not very familiar with teams but uh, i think we can see it uh... content very clearly so i should yeah i think that's fine yeah yeah you so can the next slide goes away but that's okay oh okay how about now can you see it yeah uh, we can see it i mean it's still not full screen but no, i think that should be fine uh, okay. uh, yeah all right uh, all right i'll just keep going um i think uh, the overall theme that i wanted to touch on is uh, using design not just as a incremental tool for improvement but as a uh, as a holistic strategic toolkit for uh, 
creating and transforming businesses from the ground up. And of course, I'm sure with all the wonderful work uh, you guys have been doing it, uh, I'm preaching to the choir in many ways. So forgive me if I'm going through territory that you've already covered, but I just wanted to uh, share some personal experiences around that. Um, by the way, just checking when I'm changing the slide, you guys are seeing the changed slide. Are you guys seeing slide two? Oh, uh, no, no, no. no. Oh, that is very yeah, weird. No, no, now we can. Now we can. Yes. Very weird. So full screen is uh, clearly not working. All right. Yeah. So we'll adjust. Um, I think. Uh, yeah. So the you know within design circles, we are very familiar with the range of tools and methodologies that are available to us. But um, a lot of my work over the years has been about interfacing with the world outside of design and. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, there's the perception of design uh, has not changed across the world in, in many ways. Uh, a lot of people still think that it is about making things look cool or pretty or trendy, you know, choose whatever word you want to. Uh, at best, it, it is about making things uh, more user friendly um, in their minds. But uh, my work has really been about the rest of it, the everything else part, where which I think is core to uh, the design. Um, aspect of it. And uh, coincidentally, uh, a, a couple of folks here might, um, uh, you know, are alumni from the same uh, architecture school I went to in India. But I think I really got started on this journey uh, in uh, India when the first international design award we won um, was for uh, an architecture competition where we actually exploded the building and focused on the human beings inside and their interactions, their activities, their needs, their um, their interaction patterns, et cetera. And that was, I think, one of the first epiphanies for me to move away from a form-based view of design to a more human-centered view of design, even if it is uh, in, you know, less sexy in many ways um, or, or less cool. It's not about the surface at all, right? So since then, um, been working across multiple uh, organizations for in consulting corporations, startups across a range of industries, um, as uh, um, as Vishal mentioned. So, you know, with that, I've seen a few things and and I've seen innovation fail, honestly, in a thousand ways. Uh, and uh, we're talking about when we're talking about moving design upstream, we are talking about uh, moving it from these kind of downstream enhancements, enhancements where whether you call it UX, UI, product design, design systems, etc., uh, what often ends up happening is someone else, right, in a totally different function, whether it's business or en engineering or someone else who has figured out the direction of the business or the direction of the product. And design is often brought in at the end to make it look cool and pretty and uh, usable uh, and all of that, right? So the the animating force throughout my journey has been about how do we uh, move design upstream into those areas where we are figuring out direction before it has already come to a point where you are taking the final step and reskinning a product, so to speak. Right. So there are many ways in which innovation happens. Um, one of them is, of course, uh, what I call market pull. It's it's the business. Uh, determining the direction. The challenge with uh, a lot of that and where a lot of innovation fails is because uh, of ideas that make sense in PowerPoint and Excel, in slide decks and uh, Excel spreadsheets. You know, the numbers people will tell you that uh, they can cook up numbers to tell any story you want, right? So I've seen again and again, innovations fail because they make sense uh, in a boardroom and in a slideshow, but uh, not in the real world. And similarly, even if you swap it and if if you put tech first, uh, we've seen lots of examples of tech that looks amazing in the lab or in code when you're sitting and um, when creating new apps, et cetera, but, but also failing because it, it fails to take into account uh, how people will actually live their lives, right? So a classic example being the Segway 20 years back, which was supposed to transform the future of transportation and micro mobility, et cetera. And uh, and didn't go anywhere, even though it was an amazing invention from a technology standpoint. Um, and, and in fact, the the things that are being successful now, after 20 years, are are uh, in the same space of micro mobility. Are examples that are much more low tech, but takes into account the overall business business 
and uh, and human ecosystem and fits better into that, right? So uh, just a quick lesson there. And and very, very candidly, uh, you know, uh, Tanay was saying just before we started that, hey, we're even after so many years in design, we're still looking, stumbling around, we're still trying to figure out what we're doing. I've seen a lot of uh, design thinking fail in the innovation space as well, uh, very candidly, right? And especially the kind of watered down design thinking, which, um, you know, has been the, the simple, oversimplified version that is easier to market and easier to do workshops around and um, and, and really doesn't go too deep. Um, and, uh, and that fails because you can come up with amazing uh, experiences and ideas uh, in a blue sky kind of way. But if you haven't figured out the business model right from the get go or how the tech is going to work, um, it goes nowhere. It's a wonderful idea and that stays that. Right. So the obvious uh, solution, obviously, is to uh, take a more balanced and integrated approach right from the get go. It's easy to say, but it's very hard to do. And because most companies are not set up like uh, like that, uh, at least in my experience. And uh, there are specific things we have to do in order, first of all, in order for design to play in that space, rather than doing the same things we do in, in our own spaces, uh, when we are interacting with uh, the business uh, teams or the functions in a, in, in a corporation or consulting firm and or the, the tech side of it, right? So if we, if we do it right, if we, if we are able to apply the right methodologies uh, to bring our unique way of looking at the world right up front, then we get a very different result downstream, right? We get tech that serves real-world needs instead of instead of just a you know invention for invention's sake, which often ends up breaking social systems, like we have seen with social media and all kinds of other um, uh, recent uh, innovations. As well as on the business side, the business models that are aligned with customer mindsets rather than rather than uh, making sense only on paper. Right. So that kind of integrated approach is something I've always tried to push uh, with uh, with, you know, with great results and mixed results sometimes. Right. So it's a uh, it's covered a wide range of industries from food and beverage and you know, PepsiCo's and Kellogg's of the world to medical technology. This is a brain surgery uh, uh, in, in process, uh, uh, which um, I am right there in the corner observing uh, because we are trying to reinvent the future of uh, brain surgery navigation tools. Uh, because unlike uh, you know other tools, you can't actually push a camera inside the brain. You have to extrapolate it like a mini GPS, as many of you guys will know. Uh, digital banking uh, and very very unsexy areas for design, taking it into transportation, logistics, supply chains for some of the largest companies who do that in the world, right? The common theme the, across all of that, which seems very disparate, and some people outside the field would ask why, I mean, uh, how can you design all that? Uh, it's really the, the common theme around that is uh, building new human-centered businesses from the ground up and going beyond the, just the product and the experience to the things that enable the product and the experience, which to me are the process, team, culture, the business model, the strategy, uh, and the overall ecosystem and the stakeholder ecosystem in which the, our products and experiences work, right? It involves working differently, um, you know, at each stage, research uh, for validation, from moving from that to research for discovery and, you know, and going from, hey, uh, just from an engineering and a business management standpoint, a laundry list of features that you're managing to a much more holistic, insight-based experience-led um, way of, uh, of, of planning your roadmaps as a company, right? And so on and so forth. Uh, but overall, the focus is, has been really about the kind of disruptive innovation that is not just making life better for existing users and existing markets, but how do you open up new users and new markets using uh, the design toolkit working very, very closely with the rest of the organization in unique ways, right? So uh, moving design upstream to me is about uh, widening our scope to think of areas which are not considered traditionally design or have not been until the last few decades. Um, and of course, folks who are familiar with the business model canvas uh, would, would know many of this, but it's been going on for a long time. And beyond the wider scope, there's also a deeper process, which of course we don't have a huge amount of time to get into right now, but all of you may have may be familiar with large aspects of, the, of this, but um, suffice it to say that it has to be there's a different rigor that comes into play when we are doing each step 
at the upstream notion of design rather than at the downstream part, right? There are specific areas that we have to push harder for, for example, to find counterintuitive insights beyond what you would get in marketing research or more traditional research where you're just observing what is going on rather than trying to figure out uh, what people are actually trying to do that is not visible, right? The jobs to be done, their needs, their latent needs, so to speak, right? And and at, and even to oversimplify further, it's about new discovery, pushing for new discoveries that can lead to unforeseen opportunities, right? And upping our ambition dial on that front, because otherwise, I think we are just playing at the margins as a design field. So just to give you some super quick examples, the first job I did, uh, which coincidentally was an extension of my architecture background in India, um, was for a company called Steelcase, where we reinvented the future of healthcare spaces because while the technology of healthcare, MRI machines and, and other diagnostic technology, as you know, have grown in leaps and bounds, the spaces in which healthcare is delivered, where doctors, nurses, surgeons work on a day-to-day -day basis has lagged behind 100 years, right? So the, the big change here was moving a company, Steelcase, which used to sell, you know, which is more used to selling tables and chairs and cubicles to offices to get them to figure out how do we partner with hospitals to understand their work patterns and shift our business model to a much more consultative sales-based model where we are saying, instead of going to a hospital and saying, we'll sell you tables and chairs, which they don't need because they work differently, uh, going to them and saying, hey, we have studied you, and how do we work together to figure out how to, how to improve medical outcomes and how to reduce medical errors and, and reduce costs, et cetera, right? It's a very different conversation. It's about that reframe in every moment, right? So uh, I have to uh, obviously um, blur out a lot of details because of, uh, of privacy concerns, but you know, one of the largest banks in the world, uh, we reframed a challenge from, uh, for example, when they were looking at uh, how to acquire customers. It was a focus on ads and how to design better ads. But we found out that the real problem was downstream, where it was about keeping customers long-term, which banks are traditionally, at least in the US, very bad at. As soon as you get an amazing credit card and your benefits run out, you are, um, you know, you, you're done essentially and you change uh, banks. Um, how, do you, how do you flip that script into a much more positive, powerful reinforcement platform. So, uh, you know, like a hijacking, uh, you know, methodologies from social media feeds, etc., in order to, in order to um, kind of give people positive reinforcement every day, right? So, uh, and and likewise in the brain surgery space, it's not just about designing the product itself, but the e business ecosystem in which the product functions. So. Uh, looking at not just the surgeons who are using it, and on the left you'll see uh, lots of usability issues. You are you, when you are uh, operating on a patient, and you're using this multi-million-dollar device, which is across the room. There's obviously product design challenges to solve, but also uh, huge challenges when it comes to uh, making the product affordable for hospitals, which may not be doing many of these operations, maybe rural hospitals, etc. How do you make the device portable? How do you change the business model from a from a product sales model to uh, a more subscription-based model, so you're only using it when and uh, you know a portable system when when you need it, etc. Right. So in every stage, uh, this is a logistics example where, um, again, uh, the largest logistics and transportation company in the world was trying to sell technology to their customers who were supply chain managers around the world. But our our global research showed that the very different mindsets which made it more imperative for them to provide a service which provided peace of mind to customers. And I'm, I'm obviously oversimplifying. Um, and wrapping those services in value props that actually made sense to uh, customers in different ways in different parts of the globe, right? Uh, customers in Asia had very different needs from Europe, et cetera, right? So it sounds very basic, but uh, in each case, uh, in all of these cases, it was actually about using design methodologies, working very closely with other functions in the business, hand in hand, to push for new discoveries, new, I mean, to the industry or to the company, that um, if not new to the world, uh, in order to push for unforeseen opportunities, which you could not predict going into it, you know, uh, unlike a lot of business consulting where you uh, start with a hypothesis and just prove it out or validate it over the, over the years. So ultimately I'll wrap because of time, but, um, 
you know, to me, the overall journey of uh, has been about raising the ROI of innovation um, and making it a repeatable, scalable, and systematic approach rather than accidental flashes of genius, which people, a lot of people still think design is about. And also, you know, I'm sitting here in Silicon Valley where uh, the dominant methodology is actually different. It's not about a thoughtful, deliberate, and balanced approach. It's more about let's uh, let's fund a thousand things and hoping that one or two will succeed, right? So it's so um, you know that's great when you have uh, endless amounts of money to pour into venture capital. But in my experience uh, with the clients I've worked with, it's um, the ROI has mattered a lot, you know, and uh, the value you get out of what you're putting in has mattered a lot. So more thoughtful, deliberate, and balanced approaches, more strategic approaches to innovation, have been kind of imperative. Um, and the last thing I'll say is. Uh, and it's obviously a topic for another discussion, but going upstream also means going against the current and going against the grain. Uh, and for design practitioners uh, that in this space, I have seen um, it's not it's not the norm, right? So organizations are not set up like this. They will often not expect this kind of work from you. So you have to sell every day um, and explain to people the, the larger scope of what is possible and demonstrate it in ways that makes your work much harder than just doing what people expect design to do, right? Which is making things look cool and more usable, et cetera, downstream. So I'll end there because of time, but thank you very much um, for that uh, opportunity. And I'm yeah, obviously, obviously happy to happy take to questions. questions. Yeah, thanks, Kinshuk. We'll take the questions towards the end. So we'll move to the next presentations. Uh, and yes. then we'll come to the questions uh, towards the end, and then we'll have the panel discussion. So, so maybe Tanay, we can start with you. Uh, while you uh, put your slides up, I'll again read the bio. Uh, so, Tanay Kumar is a founding member and the current CEO and Chief Creative Officer of, for Fractal Link. He spearheads visual design and design strategy at Fractal Link. Tanay has a BR from BIT Mishra and MDS from IDC in visual communication, where he graduated as a gold medalist. Uh, he initially teamed up with uh, Priyanka to launch Ambiance Designs in 2002, then moved to London 2006 to join LBI, one of the largest uh, digital agency of Europe. Uh, shortly, and then he came back to India in 2010. I'm not going to go through all the details, but uh, 2010 he came back and he co-founded Fractal Inc. Uh, to sort of uh, take the digital design in India to the next level. Uh, he's worked with a number of brands uh, shaping their uh, uh, brand uh, branding, including Microsoft, F1, Disney, uh, British Telecom, Indian Railways, Nokia, and the list goes on. So I'll again stop there. So the team has grown from uh, seven people in 2010 to 120 people in 2019. I'm sure it's larger now. Uh, and it got acquired by Jensu Aegis Network, a leading global agency in 2016. Uh, under Tanay's leadership, Factor Inc. Uh, has been consistently winning India's Design Studio of the Year Award by Pool Design Magazine for the last five years consecutively. Uh, and uh, other other notable awards have come from CII, Curious, Ad Gully, and, and, and MMA. Uh, he's also an active member of CII design team, a uh, design committee, and actively involved in many with many educational institutions uh, such as ISDI, NMIMS, SPJ, and IIT Mumbai in various capacities, including curriculum design. So, Tanay, all yours. Hey, thanks, thanks, <coughs> thanks, Vishal, for the, the long paragraph that you read, actually. Uh, sorry for not cutting it down to 100 words because I was lazy enough to just send you the word document that I sent to any particular kind of really press release. So uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> King Shook, I think thank you for starting off with a, such a wonderful uh, perspective on design and how uh, design organizations are now moving upstream uh, rather than actually focusing on the downstream kind of the activities. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Vishal, I'm not able to share my screen, but I think it's it's absolutely okay for me not, not to share the screen. I hate PowerPoint actually, uh, not because PowerPoint is bad. It's just because it removes focus from uh, the person who is talking and you just keep reading the slides. Uh, so uh, for that matter, I think I'll use my slides just for, more, for my own reference right now. Otherwise, it's just pretty pictures as well that I have put there. If you want to know what's there, but the truth of the matter is, I'm not able to really clearly share the screen. Uh, you know, I think I have to start with this thing: is that there's a, such a big ambiguity around what is design. Is that we still really are trying to answer this question among ourselves? Okay, uh, I don't know. Even maybe more than hundred years uh, of our endeavor to define design, I think we still are not able to define design because. I think it's not about design being a discipline. I think design has moved on being a discipline to being 
a more broader term uh where we are able to affect uh larger decisions being made around businesses rather than actually focusing on making things beautiful as king shuk said and that's one of the reasons why uh, every time when we actually walk into a boardroom or walk into a classroom or talk to students uh uh defining design becomes uh very very difficult uh because we are not expected we are not expected uh to do one particular thing when we move into any particular organization for example when king shuk talk about king shuk sorry i'm going to really piggy back on a lot of example that you said <laughs> please uh, it's quite interesting yeah like for example when you're standing inside the operation theater and looking at the machine which is being actually trying to take pictures there you are not only expected to design that machine you also have to look towards the emotional state of the doctors the people who are helping them and the the patient there itself who is being operated upon along with the device okay imagine the amount of definitions that you will have to give to a designer to be able to go through all those and then come up with a solution which actually really works okay that's where the ambiguity starts the second ambiguity uh, ambiguousness in our profession is uh, nobody expects us to do something which has already been done okay everybody in our profession expects us to do something or come up with something as you said innovation or something which has not been done okay which which puts us in a position that along with other people we also don't know what's the outcome going to be whether it's going to be successful or not is a different question altogether whether it's going to, what is it going to be is the first question to ask as a designer and that's the kind of profession that we are into we are in a very very ambiguous state of mind and i think it will remain like that forever okay because design as i said has moved on being from a discipline to a verb where every damn thing around the world and sorry to use some words here uh uh whether it's government whether it is business whether it is product whether it is a service uh whether it's a bank whether it's a shipping company everything needs design today okay and uh and it's no longer only the responsibility of a designer who has studied design Uh, to design things, but it has gone outside us to professions where design thinking is being used by them effectively to really navigate through the waters that they are into. Okay, whether it's a process engineer or a, a, a service engineer or a bank manager, they are all using this principle to be able to really make sure that what they are delivering is acceptable uh, as a solution, either to people or to the system that they are working within. Okay, that's typically where we are in terms of design. what has happened apparently and i'm not going to really uh, because king shuk has explained in detail and i'm absolutely concurring with everything that he has said okay we are kind of really no longer designing beautiful products let's keep it that way but what has happened and what i'm going to talk about is my experience in catering to such needs from the business side as a design organization what do we need to do okay because our scope has suddenly expanded we are no longer kind of really expected to be in a small room and kind of do some quick sketches and do some great renderings and then that's going to sell okay we have we have we have suddenly expanded our own kind of really scope of work immensely so how do you build such an organization which has such a big demand from the company side or from the business side to respond to it because uh initially i have seen that organization design organization were small okay they were they were like 10 people 15 people organizations which is to do beautiful designs etc suddenly your need for design has expanded and so has the need for design organizations to start kind of responding to such a need and trust me it has been a roller coaster all through to build an organization especially in the design because it doesn't work it doesn't work as in a traditional sense like a manufacturing or a product companies it is not hierarchical okay every damn designer that you intake as a person as an employee or probably as a designer in a company has their mind of their own they want to have their own stamp on the work they want to kind of really start their own stuff they are all entrepreneur okay they are not kind of really going to really sit around behind a desk to be able to do that and you ha- don't have to so they they work very differently okay and uh, today uh, factlink has more than 100 employees or 100 designers working for them uh and i think that itself has been a great achievement uh, that i packed myself for uh, because getting 100 designers to work together is a nightmare each one of them is and and trust me every designer is built of ego okay big egos okay 
uh, whether he is graduating or whether he has like 15 years of experience behind him, they are built of big egos. And how do you manage egos within, within an organization which is 100 people? Okay. Uh, combined with that, today, when you walk into an organization, you have other side of the table uh, with experts who actually have spent years of trying to narrow down on a business problem or a service problem or a design problem. They have already narrowed it down and they have their own kind of really uh, vision about how to solve the problem. Now, imagine these two coming together to solve a problem. Okay, That itself is a big problem to really handle. And that's where we as design organizations actually have to start kind of really coming out of our, I would say, Lala land. Okay, think that we are the ones who want to change the world. For us, I think the bigger question or bigger kind of acceptance should be that uh, as a designer, I think the biggest learning that we have is that it's a collaborative journey towards solving a problem. Not one person, not one mind can solve it, but a, a collection of people uh, who respect each other uh, when they are put together across a table are going to solve the problem together. That's, that's where that's where I think the true uh, value of design can be visualized. Otherwise, uh, running companies like 100 people or 200 people or 1,000 people and then trying them to actually work towards an innovation uh, uh, is, is, is a nightmare. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> for, for me, uh, it has been, uh, I have never kind of really, and I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying that probably I'm not the boss. Okay. Uh, yes, there is a, a feeling of, or there's a gratification that yes, I built this company, but never ever I have walked into the office uh, uh, with the scap of a boss there. Okay, uh, because you know the moment the moment you actually start in a design organization, start talking like it's your word, which is going to be the final word. That's a death of, of an organization. Okay, that's the death of a design organization, because. The problem is that the world itself, and as King Shun mentioned, technology, okay, the world itself is moving so fast, is so fast that you alone cannot be able, cannot be, cannot be actually, uh, cannot really change the world yourself, okay? You have to start accepting that there is a world around you which actually understands and kind of contributes to uh, various factors which actually make anything move upwards that acceptance is going to really make yourself, make you humble. It will make you kind of really start believing that, you know what, there are, there are, there's help around, there's help around. As a designer, you're not a god. Uh, there are kind of things which actually you have to do along with people to really make that come up, okay? Uh, rest, rest. I think uh, I, I will keep it to questions. I will not kind of really bore you with any more content here. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, uh, as I said, in a single line or a single statement or a single slide, I will ever be able to explain what I've gone on in defining design. So, uh, so uh, I will I open up uh, to the questions and see uh, what kind of really questions we have triggered among Kingshuk and myself uh, among the crowd to be able to really answer this much more efficiently. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Tanay. So we'll, as I said, again, we'll keep, we'll park the questions for, uh, you know, uh, until we have heard all the speakers, uh, and then we'll come to the panel discussion. So I'll, I'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you again. Uh, so we have uh, with us Vinayak Krishnamurti. Uh, Vinayak already sort of before many of you were here, we had a quick, uh, and he already also gave a presentation uh, before this talk. So, uh, so Vinayak Krishnamurti is an associate professor. Um, Morris E. Foster Faculty Fellow uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and an affiliated affiliate faculty in the Department of Computer Science at Texas A&M. Uh, Vinay Kern is MSc uh, Engineering from CPDM uh, and his PhD from Purdue. Uh, his work focuses on geometric modeling, product design, and generative design. Uh, Vinay's dissertation research led to the commercial deployment of Z-Pots or Z-Pots, as Americans would call it. Uh, a virtual pottery app in collaboration with uh, Zero UI, a California-based uh, startup. All yours, Vinak. Well, uh, thank you. Um, yes, please.
ऊपर स्लाइड कर दे All right. Well, um, there's a reason why the title says position presentation, right? Because the question was, what is design? I mean, you know, that's a dangerous question to <laughs> to ask a design academic specifically, as has already been said by uh, you know Tana and uh, Kingship before. Uh, but you know, my experience with design. As an academic, is not just as an academic. I I uh, um, direct a lab called Mixed Initiative Design Lab. The broader perspective or the vision, rather, is to explore ways in which uh, human technology partnership can happen in different ways, shapes, and form. And from that perspective, uh, the uh, the stuff that I like about uh, being a design researcher, specifically in the flavor of work that I do, is that it also forces me to be a design practitioner, right? Um, so, in a, as a design practitioner, I, I want to share some thoughts um, on interaction design, which is kind of where my design practice comes, right? Um, the first time I realized that I was doing design. Was when I was actually coding for Professor Sin, right? We were writing a code for digital human modeling uh, tool, and uh, you know that was the first time that I ever thought that I was taking very specific decisions that pertain to somebody else being able to use the code, right? We were writing application programming interfaces APIs, uh, and usually when we talk about design, we never think about uh, coding as a context. Right, but to program is to design. Right, how do you represent and present data or the flow of data to another person? That other person can be you. Right, so you can design for yourself too. That's the power of uh, good programming. That's the first time I realized that I was designing, and this is uh, saying something because I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering. Everybody does a capstone project. Right, that's notably the design project of your uh, undergraduate career. You see, so this realization is uh, was was very crucial for my development as a design practitioner too. Uh, you know, later uh, as I moved more into design research, uh, the context for design practice came as a means to think about. How information is represented and presented to the user. My specific context was to support design ideation, and I developed um, a, quite a few tools as a part of my dissertation research. One of which actually ended up uh, unfolding into a commercial enterprise, which currently cu currently now runs. Uh, you know, I'm more into the academic side of things, right? But as the first and sole product developer <laughs> for the company, uh, right, which was an experience. Uh, Uh, all by itself, right? Imagine that you are uh, at a place like Maker Fair in California, and you are talking to roughly 500 to 700 children uh, for two days straight, right? Every day, Now, these kids—they are no joke, right? They're like my son, currently five years old, this high, will come and ask you, "Is the code going to save it as a PLY or an STL file?" Like. Man, I didn't know <laughs> know about file formats <laughs> until I was, you know, 25 or 26 years of age, and and this is reality, right? Uh, children are now uh, in presence of a lot more information. Okay, so as designers, we have to uh, appreciate that as well. Try to figure out how do you help. Uh, Coalesce all that information and make it visible to the user in a way, shape, and form that they can effectively do their task, right? So uh, the first example that I wanted to show you. So this was our pottery application. It was sort of, you know, in a five-year PhD, one and a half years was purely product development. So it's only three and a half years worth of research that I defended at the end of five years. But this in itself was a very Uh, enthralling experience for me, precisely because of direct contact with 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 users, particularly younger audiences. So my interaction uh, design experience has primarily focused on younger audiences, novices, right? Not trained designers or engineers for that matter. And you realize that designing for uh, those audiences is way different, and in some cases harder, right? Because there are many assumptions that we tend to make as design practitioners. When we know that our audiences have certain background, right? If you're creating a nut for a mechanic, you know the mechanic knows how to operate the nut. 
okay but when you start going into uh, lower ages everything is uh, open game right you don't know what the user which is a child is going to do to your tool forget with your tool <laughs> right and that uh, had a huge impact on uh, even my academic forays into design research later on uh, another uh, experience i want to share so i have worked a lot with design teams both as a faculty and as a student so this was another one of our patents that uh, you know got commercialized this was on haptic feedback you know this is the clunky version but we have the the nice smooth version um, of uh, of hand based haptic feedback and this was again a very important learning um uh, experience for me uh, because you know tanay was earlier talking about the the role of leadership right uh, this is and this is not just for product designers this is also for engineering designers and for students specifically right there's always hundreds of different types of ways of doing things and if you are not Uh, uh you know in the know how of who the leading member is or for that matter who the leading member is at a specific point of time things can go astray very very quickly right so uh, design research researchers always t uh, like talking about team dynamics and all those types of things it's quite complex in the real world and you know this is not in real world i'm talking about a capsule project here right so these uh, design practice experiences actually helped me hopefully become a decent design researcher and educator right so as an educator i wish to share the following story which again goes back to what uh, uh, you know tanu already mentioned uh, this is a typical conversation between two mechanical engineering faculties at generally many us institutions right Uh, what is your research area i am a design researcher or really uh, i am also a design researcher what do you design that's the question right now you see the problem is that uh, most researchers in other disciplinary domains are design practitioners okay the fundamental difference between being a design researcher and a design practitioner is that as a researcher as a design researcher you are the designer for the designer right you are studying the process of design the process of design cognition uh, or uh, you know developing tools for doing different ways of design and so on and so forth that is something that is still not clear forget about the definition of design right there is definitely ambiguity uh, as an example uh, in the last month of my phd Uh, my advisor sent me to this very nice uh, grantees meeting uh, hold, uh, held by nsf uh, the last day the second the third day was and this is all like you know uh, big names in the design academic domain right uh, the goal the agenda for the meeting was to find out a nice definition of design right so as uh, you know a thermodynamics person studies thermal systems what does a design person do guess what the answer was after 3 hours of major brainstorming people scribing like crazy on the whiteboard nothing came out of it right because george hazel rig is saying well it's an art of decision making somebody else is saying oh no no it's about creativity somebody else is saying this and that and that i actually like design precisely for that reason i do not want it to change right let it be so because you see it is a pervasive thing any engineering field you consider aerospace electrical electronics whatever they have something that connects with design right therefore i think it is important for us to appreciate the diversity the intellectual diversity that comes with design which is what i also try to tell my students both at the undergraduate and graduate level right how do you embrace ambiguity again right most students uh, if you give them more information in a question right i have done this i have data on this right more information on a on an engineering question they will flunk the test right because they know that the formula takes four numbers two on the left hand side two on the right hand side give me three i'll give you the fourth one give them five okay gone there is a very strong need for design 
in education right now because as uh, uh, you know as engineering practitioners there is a need for embracing that ambiguity that comes inherently in real world problems okay and this is something that i i have learned both as a practitioner and as a design researcher for the past uh, uh, you know uh, one and a half decades or so right uh, so i have introduced a new course in the department which i've been teaching and coordinating for the last 5 years it's a course on geometric modeling for design people come in thinking that it's a course on solid works for 3d printing right you have to take that mentality out and say no no it is geometric modeling for design those are not the same things as solid works for 3d printing forget the tool right i always ask this question why are we using solid works somebody will say it's intuitive right somebody will say oh, it's easy to create shapes so no it's free that's all there is to it right <laughs> what the fundamental tenets of design are completely devoid of the tool right and that is something also that we have to encourage early in the design curriculum right so i am going to uh, stop here and give the uh, floor to me thank you oh i'll take that uh... all right so thank you again vinayak uh, of course manish does not need introduction here but uh, for the audience and for the others uh, and uh, i have taken the liberty of uh, creating uh, it on my own so So, Dr. Manish Arora is an associate professor in CPDM ISC. Uh, his research areas are biomedical devices, co-design, collaboration in open source uh, in design, additive manufacturing, and so on. Uh, Manish also leads the Utsa Lab. Uh, he's also actively involved with the CPD Med, uh, which is the technology business incubator for uh, medical biomedical devices. Uh, he's also part of the COE, which is Center of Excellence for Additive Manufacturing. involved with smart factory and again the list goes on so again i'll stop there uh, he's a, he has a btech uh, in chemical engineering from iit delhi and a phd in uh, applied physics from university of twente the netherlands and he has previously worked in university of oxford uh, g global research nanyang uh, technical university singapore and uh, is actively involved in various startup activities so money is all yours thank you vishal for creating that <laughs> bio as well for me uh, sorry i couldn't send it on time but yeah uh, I have a few slides to share, but uh, I think as uh, Vishal mentioned, my journey uh, has been from an engineering student to engineering practitioner, not practitioner much, engineering researcher to a design uh, department. So that's okay. So is that better? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think the, the couple of slides which I put together for this uh, meeting here are about part of the work which I do at the department, specifically looking at medical device innovation process, and I put them in framework of journeys. which are not completed yet in, in the sense that they have not reached the uh, the the consumers yet the users yet uh, but their journeys nevertheless and their design journeys because users are involved in those journeys so that's the process, uh, the, the slides will cover that if you go go to the next slide i think some of the logos are missing but that's okay uh, of course uh, overall process here is a design driven uh, process for affordable and accessible medical technology uh, technology products what whatever you want to call it at the end of it there are solutions for problems which are not solved and affordable and accessibility is again a challenge which exists in india but also around the world it's not something which is limited to to india uh, if you make a affordable solution here in india i think it will uh, be usable uh, everywhere else also but of course you'll have to tweak it to the the local geographies as well so again a lot of it is again technology centric uh, we are looking at medical technology and therefore requires a uh, lot more uh, technical development but also uh, what i've learned uh, being at the department and uh, maybe a little while before that also is to connect with the users uh, to find what their needs are and that uh, informs the process but not only the users but also other stakeholders who are involved in that product or eventually uh, who have the problem for whom is solving this so that has kind of incorporated into the, the philosophy of the lab which i lead here uh, to develop products which are uh, usable by the society of course uh, the, the the process involves identifying the needs uh, meeting with the users uh, eventual uh, people who have the problem but also conceptualizing as you do in engineering design process 
at times technology development uh, maybe it's not required in some cases if you have a innovative solution which uses existing technology but at times involving technology development as well where you are at the uh, forefront of the technology not meeting those requirements which are there of course that has to translate into a product and that involves being able to manufacture that product and therefore we need to think a little bit more about that product how will that get manufactured are there is there an ecosystem available to actually manufacture it can you put in quality controls from in the design process itself such that the design is manufacturable in a quality manner uh, with, with a quality product at the end there are a couple of examples uh, which are on this slide but i'll talk about more others in the next slide uh, these are just some of the examples which are left in open source so others can also use it uh, ivy drip monitoring system which is basically a simple device for uh, looking at iv uh, lines the intravenous lines being given to, to patients in india specifically we have a challenge that uh, nursing staffs are uh, very difficult to find or or are heavily heavily overworked and they are not able to monitor the iv lines so can there be technology intervention which can provide that the product was designed tested in a clinical setting and used design is uh, available as an open source hardware design published in open hardware x anybody can replicate that and we are thinking of using that as a tool for teaching uh, various components of the medical product itself right? including the electronics uh, which goes into it the mechanical components which go into it the second example on this slide is also about a research which a phd student actually carried out working on a uh, fetal heart rate monitoring system again a problem originating from ground up in india uh, healthcare workers in remote areas don't have right tools for monitoring fetal uh, health here there's a solution which is uh, primarily this research student worked on algorithms which will work out a low signal to noise problem for detecting heart rate in those uh, difficult circumstances so even though these are technically one is a technically simple solution other one is technically challenging but both of them originate from ground up uh, working with the doctors so that's uh, the idea which i'm talking about next i have a few slides on a couple of journeys which are uh, ongoing in some sense in the lab uh, this is led by Deval Karia in the lab. He's ex uh, CPDM student, but been with the lab uh, as EIR, uh, various awards which have uh, been awarded to, to this project and him uh, on development of a affordable insulin pump. Insulin pump has been around as a device. It's primarily a device for delivering insulin in a continuous manner to, to people. It's been around for about 20, 30 years. Uh, out there, but it's unaffordable. It's as expensive as a car. Uh, this is a small pocket carry device this size. It will cost you a car right? to, to have that in your pocket uh, to be able to treat that. And that results in this technology, which is proven to be medically helpful, not being accessible, not being affordable by large chunks of Indian population. So we needed a completely different approach, even though the box looks similar from outside, inside there's a mechanism, a patented mechanism, which allows us to bring down the cost. That is the innovation which we are try trying to commercialize. It has been tested in the lab a number of times. Uh, we have a number of working prototypes. Now we're taking it to a stage where we will take it to uh, animal testing and then subsequently. But the point which I want to make here is that which they will, will probably complain about. It took us five years to actually do this from that concept which was there to have a working technical product. Of course, this journey has not been void of contact with the users. It be began as an MDS project, as many of you would know, that, that involves immersion. You will talk to uh, potential users and then uh, go ahead and interact, uh, develop your concepts, technical products uh, from there. And uh, that journey has continued to uh, interact and engage with the users because every feature which you're developing was in, in collaboration with the, with the users. That's how this product has evolved. Of course, it has not been in the market, but of course, we have got a lot of feedback from users uh, along the way. So hopefully, it, it will be uh, uh, at the right price point. It will be usable by the, by the end users as well. Another journey which uh, we, I'll sh highlight here is uh, with uh, Komal Shah, again, ex uh, CPM student. Uh, till recently, she was also EIR, Entrepreneur Res Residence here. Uh, 
uh, working on a problem which you will not normally talk about, urinary incontinence, right? Uh, that's, again, a sensitive issue. Uh, people uh, have that. One in three women would have it at some point in their life, and we would not even discuss that as a problem at, at times. Here, there is a solution which has been developed, which is a medical device. It involves electrical stimulation to strengthen the pelvic floor muscles. Technological solution was easy to, to kind of come up with once you knew the problem. And again, that's kind of uh, goes back to the design philosophy. Talking to the users, you know where the gap is. And then looking at the technology piece, how that existing technology or new technology can help that. There are some patents which uh, make this device unique, but irrespective, making it affordable and accessible is still a challenge. And then we're working on on piece uh, to take it forward as well. A problem uh, closer to my heart is around uh, treatment of uh, uh, or diagnosis in early pregnancy or uh, during pregnancy of using ultrasound. As I said, I've uh, worked in biomedical space for a long time and most of it was spent in ultrasound. And there was a big challenge. Ultrasound as a technology was uh, very exciting. You can do a lot of things with it, but there was a lot of misuse of that in Indian ecosystem. People use that to determine the gender of the fetus, and oftentimes, because of male preference, uh, they will uh, the female fetus will be killed. It's, one would equate it to a murder, but uh, again, laws are different uh, at times. Uh, nevertheless, this is a solution which allows uh, that problem to go away, and also another important problem that we don't have enough radiologists to provide for uh, pro, uh, ultrasound technology to be accessible at remote areas. It's a tele-ultrasound system which enables you to capture 3D ultrasound in remote settings and then do the analysis remotely, either with help of existing radiologists or potentially in the future with the help of AI technologies or, or uh, data-driven tools as well. So again, these are simple. Uh, I'll not deliver the point even more. I think you can skip the last uh, uh, example, but we can go to the list of the uh, the projects which are out there, this is another. Uh, so there are a number of such activities which are going on in the lab uh, as research projects, as design projects, to take them forward as a, a as a product is something which is my my wish, and I think the department facilitates that to a large extent by these channels of having entrepreneurial in residence program, but also supporting the startups going forward. So I think the ecosystem is developing out there, and the design philosophy which we have to look at uh, really socially relevant technological challenging problems which we are able to address is something which uh, I really appreciate from this community that uh, we are able to take this forward and uh, uh, develop these products in, in, in. So these are incomplete journeys so to say but hopefully uh, in near future we will take it to the uh, market as well. So if you uh, go to the last slide, I just want to thank everybody in the lab. Uh, of course, not everybody is there in this picture, but this is how we could capture everybody in, in a small space using the CCD camera in the lab. So uh, thank you, everyone, who have been supporting this journey and also the department for, for all the support. Thank you. Thanks, Manish. Uh, I think you can hold on to the mic. So what I'll do is uh, uh, I'll get, uh, just give me a moment, I'll get everyone on screen. Uh, before we start the panel discussion, I'll just reverse it this time. So we'll start with the Q&A. Uh, so you have heard the four uh, talks. I'll invite the audience to ask questions. We'll keep it for 10 minutes max. So uh, you need to order your questions accordingly so that you ask the more pertinent questions first. Well, very difficult to judge that on your own right, of course. Uh, so questions, and uh, please tell us who you are directing your questions to. Nobody has questions? Everybody's eating, uh, busy eating, maybe. Okay. All right. Nobody? I have a okay. So please pass on the mic there. Hi. This is, um, in some sense, a proposition rather than a question. You know, whenever we come to the question of what is design, we sort of hesitate between being, you know, specific versus generalist, right? So I am proposing that if it is difficult to define what is design, right, can we start defining what is not design, 
right something like instead of starting the sentence like design is nothing but typically definition start like this i am proposing that design is anything but <laughs> right can we have some idea on that that what is a, what type of thing is not about doing design right can we uh, at least delineate that if otherwise uh, design is anything and full stop you know that doesn't sound very nice all right who wants to take it before uh, you do i'll just make a comment at least in design research community there is enough discussion on what is not design so in the literature you will find but yes it is not gone into the practice and that has not come out so i think that's a uh, design researchers need to do a better job at uh, taking it to the practice having said that i think uh, i'll invite the panelists to comment on this what is not design kingship you had a broader view so maybe you can start well you know there are many ways to tackle it it's a great question um i think uh, one uh, one direction i take for this because i do believe that design is a horizontal capability uh, you know kind of like language you know it's a it's a human capability that as soon as we started uh, rethinking what our current reality is you are in a design space and obviously there overlaps with engineering and other disciplines but uh, to me design is everything that is not default right if you're going with the default in any situation whether it's a product a social system a business system uh, and uh, uh, and reality as we know it conventional wisdom uh, so when you're going when you're rethinking the default or changing the default that impulse to me is about design obviously it's oversimplified and you could poke many holes in that but that's a starting point for me ta uh, tane any thoughts i think the <clears throat> it's a very interesting uh, thought and yes we steer away from this question uh, i i forget the name of the gentleman who actually really is this question can you what's his name okay sen yes sorry so who asked the question yeah who asked the question yeah professor dibakar sen uh, uh professor sen i think it's a, it's a, it's a very very it's a, it's a very interesting question to really uh, answer in a sentence i think we can all have views about why we are actually staying away from defining design and uh uh it's equally it's equally actually difficult to de define what's what's not design uh for me uh anything which actually really exists okay exists and we are able to perceive as as it is okay uh is is not design okay it's just discovery that we are trying to do here uh anything which actually builds upon uh reacting to the existence of any particular thing is uh the reaction itself is design and that reaction might be anything it reaction might be you walking up to the home, to your home and finding your home in a messy state you start to design uh your home itself okay uh so anything which actually is a reaction to a status quo or an existence of a particular thing is actually design for me thank you uh like oh well i prepared just for this occasion <laughs> i have notes <laughs> i wrote no because you know uh, uh, i agree that we often shy away from this so it's sort of one view let me pose four different views of <laughs> of what design design is uh, uh, bearing in mind that it is not about being correct about no, it no, no. Right? remember mm -hmm. the question is what design is not right right so whatever i say <laughs> negate it <laughs> okay so not view one not view two not view three and four right uh i i think the answer of what is not design also lies in the question itself right what is design so suppose i say engineering design say a little specific right um say as opposed to analysis so it is not analysis right given a system find its behavior that is analysis uh given a design behavior uh, find me an embodiment for a system okay that's one view Uh, uh you know as uh, some of us may uh, study in engineering design in a grad class right so from a design thinking perspective you can think about it as an interplay between society economy and technology 
right? Which basically maps to desirability, feasibility, viability, right? Um, from a knowledge-based standpoint, a thought that occurred to me was, it's an iterative interplay between search, organization, and synthesis. And I tend to take this uh, particular route of, uh, or view of looking at design, right? Search, organization, and synthesis, okay? And from a cognitive standpoint, act of iterative disambiguation of an opportunity that a designer seeks to take towards a situation that is more desirable than the current one. Right, so this is sort of a slight modification to Herbert Simon's uh, completely vague description, like going from undesired to desired states. And I ask my questions: Well, door is open. I don't want it. Right? Is closing the door design? I am going. I'm taking a, an action from an undesirable to a desirable state. Is that design? Right? So that is not design <laughs> in answer to Professor Sin's question, right? Um, so there are different views, and uh, I think the uh, the reason why I like the search organized synthesized part is because uh, more often than not, we always associate, we say things like creative, right? So creation is happening, okay? And I think that it is not one activity, it is sort of a cycle of those activities. When I say search for what? It could be for a problem, we do opportunity uh, uh, searches, right? Before there is a product, we want to see whether there is a need for a product, right? Uh, similarly, we also organize uh, different types of information. And as we do that, we synthesize, right? Um, often when we study this design methodology, we study it in a sequence. I personally do not think that that's how it goes in a real practice. All these three things affect each other in a cycle, right? So, well, those are my two cents on what is not this. <laughs> so I, I think this question has been deliberated quite a lot in design community. I, I don't read it so much because I, I, I think at times these questions do not matter. Uh, maybe it matters for people who, are, who want to define it, uh, but for others, maybe it doesn't matter. As long as you can practice design, it's good enough. But I think from a practice point of view, I would say design, what is not design, I would say it's not status quo. You want to change something. Why, how, all that probably will, will come in. But maintaining status quo is not design. That's what I will I'll say about it. But that's again coming from a practice point of view, not necessarily uh, design research community or other views like that. Thank you for the question. All right, there's another question up there. Is passing the mic. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah. yeah. What is the importance of motivation and design process, and uh, how do we integrate that importance into every step of the process? Could you repeat that again? What is the importance of motivation in a design process, and how do we integrate that importance in every step of the process? Right. Again, it's a general open question to the panel. Open. Okay. So again, we'll start with the people online. Or Manish, you have the mic. I have the mic, so I, I can maybe yeah, yeah. take the first stab at it. So again. If you define design as a process of going from this undesirable state to desirable state, which is quite often used as a definition, the undesirable state itself is a motivation, right? You, you're, you are in an undesirable state. How you empathize with that, because if it's not your problem, it's somebody else's problem. If you don't empathize with that, you will not be motivated to move forward. So in some sense that empathy, maybe a level of compassion also is required to go to that state of undesirable state. The process can be learned. The process can be taught. Process also comes from your basic tools of engineering science division. So the process is not the important part. The motivation, in my opinion, I think comes from empathy, which is a basic human tenet, right? You, you see a problem, you see that needs to be solved, and it will be in your mind how, if you connect with that problem, uh, and, and the people affected by that, obviously that motivation will come. If it's not grounded in that, it often becomes difficult. If you are only given a problem in the exam paper, this is what you need to solve, that may not, you may not pursue with it for a longer period of time. If you don't know it, you don't know it, you'll go away and maybe some other motivation will, will kick in. But if the problem is something which you have really empathized with, you will work towards working on it uh, long term. That's my feeling and experience also. Nice. 
No, uh, I think that design to an extent is a personal act, which makes me think that motivation is something that is intrinsic, right? I mean, you know, we're talking about status quo, like changing the status quo, okay? If you have a stimulus, uh, which gets you to an opportunity, uh, unless you actually yourself feel the need to change that status quo, you're not going to take any steps to do it because at the end of the day, when you take any type of a decision, you are irrevocably allocating resources, mental, emotional, physical, uh, you know, monetary, and so on and so forth. Therefore, uh, I don't see uh, motivation as something important to the design process. I think it is inherent and essential without that there is no design process right so it's a personal journey as far as i'm concerned all right then uh, can money be the answer <laughs> no so seriously i mean i think uh, i think i think the the answer previous to mine was probably closer to what I would try to accept that it's more intrinsic as a nature. I think I think we're trying to answer uh, questions which are uh, which are which are actually probably left unanswered. Okay, everybody as human beings, we are all kind of really motivated to uh, to go towards things which are which are unresolved or or or, or slightly mystified. Okay, whether it's a solution, whether it's a uh, 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 it's a relationship for example okay uh, a guy designs his proposal to a girl uh, in order to kind of really change the status quo but that motivation comes from actually being not knowing what's going to be the result okay the whole ambiguity around that itself is is because i don't know okay and and we human beings are just slaves or kind of really we are slaves to actually trying to find out uh, what's going to be the result of that and that actually is motivation at each stage uh, uh, so, so yeah, that's probably what I would see as motivation for designers is. Sure. You know, I'll take yeah, a different take a tack different on this, this, honestly, uh, because uh, the, the thing, the challenge with defining anything with design is because whatever you say, the opposite is also true. So, for example, if you just take any random things we have talked about, uh, making the undesirable desirable, uh, and, and I'll promise I'll come back to the motivation piece. Uh, uh, there are situations where you have to make the desirable undesirable. Uh, I'll just take a random example. I think Manish uh, talked about the ultrasound project, right? For a lot of people, it might be desirable to do something that uh, that might be wrong. So in that case, the motivation, uh, then it is not intrinsic in that situation. We actually have to change the motivation or you can debate whether you want to change the motivation because you are taking a parochial approach to what other people believe their life should be. So I think there are, I think the, the reason design is so interesting uh, to me and to many other folks is because uh, of this ambiguity. We have to wrestle with it. In many other fields, uh, there, especially in the sciences, even though people are amazingly smart, much smarter than designers sometimes, there is a reductionist approach. You have to reduce in order to uh, to kind of uh, solve a problem or to or to solve an equation. You have to say all other things being true, you have to uh, you, you know that this equation works right. But in design, often uh, if we do our jobs right, we don't have that luxury. So for for so Manish and his amazing team can solve the technical problem of that ultrasound, which I don't understand how it works yet. I would love to, but uh, where the gender of the baby is not determined. But getting people to use it uh, or getting people to choose that over another alternative um, and making that the default in the country is uh, is a very different challenge, right? You are talking in, in psychological, sociological terms, and suddenly your design problem, when you zoom out from that frame, changes from motivating a group of uh, technology-minded folks to solve the technology problem to motivating users and society to think differently about the problem is a very different problem altogether, right? So I think the frame of reference is one of the most important things in design of framing and reframing of who you're designing it for and uh, also being a little fearless in expanding the frame so that 
uh, we can't like solve just the product problem or the technical problem and you know wash our hands of it and say hey we've done our jobs a portfolio piece check right um, but we have not actually solved the problem in the world right so i think uh, that kind of uh, motivation challenge is very interesting to me and honestly uh, there is a lot of manipulation involved in design, right? If you if you read the literature on persuasion and social biases and uh, mental biases, then uh, we often have to be uh, persuasive, which means we have to be manipulative. And then design becomes like any other double-edged tool. You can use it for bad, you can use it for good. So I think these are great questions, and uh, negotiating these in real life is... Uh, what makes design uh, fruitful as an as a uh, as a profession for me personally? Yeah, I think I think just to add to what uh, one of the anecdotes uh, in real life scenarios, uh, we were we were designing this app for one of the uh, commercial vehicle uh, agriculture vehicle manufacturer in India. I, I'm actually bound by India to not say the name, but you would know one of the largest ones about. And they wanted to build an app with us where we can uh, configure the tractors. Okay, and you can look at different parts of the tractor to configure it. And we did a beautiful job and we did kind of really, really nice interface. You can actually configure a tractor like you are configuring a pizza. Yeah, and, uh, and then kind of really share it with uh, the farmer and uh, get an approval and et cetera, et cetera. We did all kind of those journeys, user journeys, et cetera. When we entered the field and talked to one of the dealers in deep down villages, uh, the one question that he had was, how can I take a printout in A4? <laughs> yeah, and in the digital world, okay, uh, that question was actually the motivation to start thinking again that, you know what, I think the communication that we are thinking about between a farmer who is a client, actually end client and the dealer happens through paper rather than anything else. And he wants to see this big paper with his tractor printed out. Okay, and written down and him explaining with the pen there being an intrinsic part of the process, which we actually really missed out in the view of that, you know, what the whole world is digital. Yeah? So we had to dial down back. We had to dial down back our motivation to really provide all the facilities of digital to something which is much more tangible and kind of applicable to the whole scenario. So as King Shuk mentioned, I think I think when we when we change our frame of of actually what we are trying to really look at, I think the whole motivation also changes the whole problem statement also changes uh it doesn't really remain a problem which is embedded within a particular discipline it starts to kind of really start going into different parts of our uh, uh or kind of this different kind of really specialities and i think that's where the beauty is that's where the beauty is this this ambiguity is what we're talking about this is what the beauty of the field of design is and that's what, at least, at least that's what motivates me. That you know what, whatever I design probably can be challenged, and can be reversed, or can be kind of really manipulated or changed into in future. And that's that's the beauty of it. Right. Thank you. So we have had two questions, both profound questions. So can we have simpler questions, which will take shorter time so that I can come to the panel discussion. So can we take one last question, a short one, a simple one? I know. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, I, my question is towards uh, Tanay. Uh, I wanted to know your insights on uh, intellectual property rights uh, while uh, managing a team of 100. So normally the IPR resides with the client because he's the one who kind of really, we are in the service business. We are not in the business of creation for ourselves right now. We are not in a product business. We work on hire, which means that somebody has hired me to challenge or kind of really given me a challenge to solve a problem. So uh, the IPR resides uh, at the end clients and in my case, uh, if that's that's what you are asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so with that, uh, now that was a good simple question. Took shorter time, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll come back to the questions that I had as a moderator. Um, I had put five questions. Uh, but somehow it seems the first one is always taken up uh, as the default for the presentation. So it's been discussed. So I'll skip that, which was to do what does design or designing mean to you? <laughs> I think we have discussed it uh, at length. Um, so I'll come to the second question. And this question arises from, I'll explain the context of the question as well. So what does being a designer mean from a society's perspective? 
And please explain it from the perspective of somebody who's going to graduate out and work as a designer, because we have talked about moving design from uh, to the you know more significant uh, levels, right? Where uh, moving it upstream, and we do try and teach that. And then question comes is of placement and recruitment, and then suddenly they are at loss because companies are looking at people with skills immediately and not people who can think and uh, you know deliberate about design. So uh, how do we deal with that? So. What does it mean to be a designer from a society's perspective? Uh, and as I said, please explain it to somebody who's going to graduate out and start looking for jobs as a designer. So maybe I'll start with uh, King Shook and then we'll come to Tane uh, from your experiences and we'll go. I think uh, there, are, there are two dichotomies that I uh, that any designer needs to, uh, you know, that that's uh, graduating uh, needs to consider. One is, as Tanai mentioned, there is money and making a living and supporting families and all of that on one hand, and therefore either taking jobs or creating uh, roles for themselves that have some specific utility in the, in uh, for you know clients or customers or, or companies, right? And on the other hand, there is this notion of not wasting an amazing uh, capability or talent that is unique not very well represented in many other fields, uh, you know, and I'm using it broadly, right? So an engineer might be a designer, a business person might be a designer, but uh, it may be untapped, right? That capability. So how do you define, how do you balance those two things? To me, uh, a, a short kind of, uh, in a quip I would say is uh, the role is to be a Trojan horse, right? Uh, where the outer casing that you come into the world is the, is the, is the vehicle for doing things that people might want, but internally there are there is a different motivation that is motivating you. Whether it's a, a technology motivation of hey uh, we can design things that are much better than what the status quo is, or whether it's transforming lives, like you're doing it for some people that matter to you or some group of people, um, and say hey I want to uh, you know reduce poverty in the world, right? Or or say even something more esoteric, like, hey, I want business to be more creative. Um, and uh, I, I think it's becoming too impersonal and too, uh, uh, you know, money minded, whatever it is, right? But this, but this, this to me, there's this notion of the vehicle uh, with which you interact with the world. Uh, and it's the, it's the software of that vehicle of, of like, what are you actually trying to do through the work that you're doing? So it doesn't matter what the medium is. You know, just like an artist can choose canvas or, uh, you know, sculpture or, or technology. Um, I think uh, the designer also has to choose what is the vehicle uh, through which they will make money and support themselves. And at the same time, uh, be able to push for broader goals beyond themselves. Cute, eh? I like the Trojan horse, though. It's a wonderful idea. I mean, it's a good way to put it. Hey, thanks. Um, thanks, yeah, thanks. That was a great kind of shell that you actually pushed the newbies into the world with. Uh, I don't know if I really understand this question. Actually, the question is about what, like, how does a designer should actually fit themselves in a society, uh, or how does what what exactly is the is, is the uh, yeah, for? yeah. So let me rephrase it. So so there's a society out there which has a view of what a designer is, which Kinshuk was alluding to as well. And yeah. there are recruiters. There are companies which are going to recruit people as graduate students, right? Yeah, yeah. And we talk and teach them to think broader, think more upstream. And there's a reality of and. Uh, uh, entry level design students graduating out of a master's program. That reality is different. How do we balance this? Okay, yeah, I mean, see, uh, the reality of the situation is that uh, uh, everything can't be taught in the field of design. Okay, every every time when you actually graduate, uh, you do feel powerful enough to change the world. Uh, you do kind of really give this education that uh, the responsibility uh, of of changing the world lies on your shoulders as a designer. And that's what you actually taught and brought out. But uh, very honestly, uh, you can't teach everything in this field uh, sitting in a classroom. And I think the first step uh, from, for me, for any, any designer who's graduating uh, or anybody that I would intake, okay? When, when we take in, I mean, we have interviews, we have kind of really uh, freshers joining us. 
the only thing that i look for right now is uh is do you have an inquisitive mind to be able to ask questions around okay uh your portfolio uh, is a reflection of the tool which is available at that particular time okay today adobe photoshop or probably a lightroom can do beautiful renderings of the photographs that you have taken uh and that might change in a year because today probably another company does a better job of uh digitally manipulating stuff or tomorrow your art is going to be outdated when mint journey or dali kind of really starts creating art which is as beautiful as yours yeah so it's just a matter of time when your your portfolio kind of is outdated so the only thing that i would say is that uh when you go out uh it's important to show okay it's important to showcase that there is an inquisitive thinking mind which is at work even when you are demonstrating your portfolio okay uh even if you have scribbled on a piece of paper i need a a five liner description of why that happened okay even if it doesn't have any form it doesn't have any kind of uh, uh, function i want you to start articulating what exactly went through your mind when you scribbled this lines on the piece of paper uh it's important because uh, uh and it's important because you never know in our field which way will you be thrown and how will you grow in your career okay today uh, i would say that after what 20 years uh, 2020 years in design uh, i at times find myself as a glorified hr okay where i am just trying to manage people rather than actually uh get creative about it okay and it's not uh, as i said it's not an easy task so you don't know which way you'll be thrown but as long as you are able to question and able to really be inquisitive about solving that problem as 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 a person i think uh your place in society in any direction is probably fixed as far as money is concerned yes it becomes a very very strong parameter today uh because uh, uh yeah you have to earn a living as such uh but it's it's i would say there is enough money if you showcase that kind of really bent of mind there is enough money there is enough money for people to put in in but they should realize that what you are and that realization is not about tools at all and portfolio thanks tane uh, this is on i guess now uh, okay so i'll ask the same question to vinay well i have never applied for a designer's job right so uh, obviously my <clears throat> experience is not going to uh, be uh, you know as good as the the answers that we have heard thus far but as a design educator i think that design is that one field that rewards breadth it rewards horizontal growth right uh, it, it is not to say that you must not know uh, or be an expert at one thing but the ability to adapt i think is very crucial and i, I believe that a good design curriculum offers you that it right? offers you the tools to uh, be able to uh, navigate through quote unquote wicked problems as we call them right problems that are not uh, kindergarten problems so originally the term came from policy making Uh, in the 70s i think uh, rital and weber okay uh, and and then people in design also use this word wicked problems right multiple solutions not um, most likely none of them correct interrelated uh, uh, you know problems solve one problem create another you know those kinds of problems okay and i think that these uh, having uh, uh, the ability to navigate these types of problems is very crucial so i wouldn't even go ahead and say uh, whether Uh, you going and becoming a designer is important no you actually can become a lot of other things too right uh, why not even think about uh, law policy making right agriculture there are many many rapidly advancing fields where there is a need for this type of thinking systems level approach right so uh, i think that as students who are going to graduate you have to broaden the places where you look for jobs right it is not just uh, i am a designer therefore i do x y and z actually there are interesting problems everywhere but that needs a new perspective of looking at the problem trying to understand things right so that's my two cents on the issue again uh, 
I may not have the right views on this because I've never applied as a job as a designer. <clears throat> but uh, having seen uh, some of the world around us, uh, my view is that the student who want to get into a Hello. Yeah. So my view on this is that the design program does teach us the breadth and ability to handle ambiguity, ambiguity uh, problem solving skills, uh, which are generic tools, uh, which will be applied to many other disciplines, not disciplines, but life in general, right? You will have these problems arising in uh, across the domains. Um, and at the end, you might be solving uh, HR problems or you might be solving problems are of a different nature, but the ability to think, uh, so to say, laterally or in a in a direction which not which is not taught in a single discipline is what differentiates a, a person trained in design, so to say. So that is a unique set skill which you have trained into, not that others cannot train into that. It's something which you can uh, uh, depend upon or in, in some sense market yourself with uh, but i don't know at at just at graduating level whether the recruiters will appreciate that easily that's where the, i think the dilemma uh, right now in the recruitment phase is but your ability to i, I think as uh, kinshuk and uh, kinshuk pointed out that the inquisitiveness being able to ask questions is something which everybody every employer looks for even in the lab when we are recruiting for project staff, we look for that ability to think, uh, question, think, and then come up with creative solutions. And that's an ability which, whether you're trained in design or not, it, it's a, a skill which you'll look for anyways. So that's what I would say in, 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 in terms of for design students to be able to go out in the market uh, and find uh, appropriate jobs. Of course, money is a, a criteria which you'll, you'll Put in, but uh, that's a skill set which you can project out. That yes, we are trained in this this skill set, and uh, find recruiters who are uh, actually looking for such things, so that they are uh, yeah. When there is a good match, that's what recruitment process is about. I, I think finding good match for your skills with the, the kind of organization which you want is looking for that. Mike, with you, so I'll ask the next question. And we'll try to have shorter answers in the interest of the three questions I still have to ask. Okay. So, of course, you said you're not trained as a designer and now you're sort of teaching in a design program. So, uh, from the beginning where you sort of delved into design to where you are now, uh, how has your views changed? And uh, I'll combine with the next question as well. Is that what, if you can point out to specific experiences or projects, people, Anything which had a significant impact in your thinking about design and how it has evolved? Sure. I think one thing which made. Hello? Is that better? Yeah, okay. So, one thing which made my journey into design very uh, personal uh, was being in front of uh, eventual users, the immersion process. Uh, as a designer, when you train uh, in the program, we have a module or a, a part of the course which talks about immersion, but really experiencing that, being in the puts of your users, in the places where you, your users are going to be, that definitely made a, a made major change for me. I never trained as a designer. I only experienced this when kind of going through curriculum of a design thinking course, and that was powerful because I knew I had other skills where I can apply technology, where I can develop codes where I can develop some solutions, but what is the problem worth solving? That only links with the per, with a designer or a, as a person for me, only when I uh, was able to immerse myself in that. So that was something which was, uh, in my personal journey, that was uh, unique. Uh, yeah. So uh, am I audible? OK. Uh, at least for me, um, my observations as a uh, both an undergrad and a 
a grad teacher affected a lot of what i thought about design coming from a trained perspective to how uh, different teams actually behave when they are trying to design and i've learned that uh, design pedagogy uh, being on one side right where we uh, systematize the process uh, sometimes actually letting things go and mixing things up in terms of the the process of design uh, can actually be for the better right we don't necessarily have to be very um, uh, what do you say rigid about the nature of the process or what works for a certain team what doesn't work for a certain team right uh, from that perspective i think a design team also discovers the design process along with the design artifact right uh, which comes from the context of the problem that they are trying to address right not all problems uh, may be solved by the same set of approaches this is this is something that often comes uh, in my advanced product design course where students who do service projects uh, tend to or rather end up not using anything that i've taught in the class so i have to literally teach them stuff outside of the class right so that's something that has happened to me over the last um, few years as a design educator uh can i okay so the question is uh, that i mean okay just for the uh, audience just to clarify for the three of us are trained from the same architecture program me tanay and kingshu and we have had very different trajectories in our career <laughs> so the point here is that uh, so at at your architecture school you go through a certain idea of what design is then it evolves over your 20 years or whatever your experience is so how has your understanding of design changed over these years and if you can point out uh, specific experiences events people projects that kind of were the most influential ones in changing your ideas of design or I design think, okay i think very interestingly i don't think so i ever kind of really so when i was graduating in design i think both all all to i mean both of you king shok and vishal i think you would concur that we how much we hated that we are not allowed to sit in the campus interviews and get those cushy jobs yeah is like you know those companies we were in from an engineering college where uh, i think in the third year of their engineering they used to get job placements and we used to have this whole parties where we were called as audience to really consume the alcohol uh but we were not the ones who were having the jobs okay so uh, uh i think it wasn't it wasn't a pleasant at that time when we were graduating i think it wasn't a pleasant thing to see that you know what i am a designer and i was not enough motivated enough to actually say that you know uh, i want to change the world itself it was more to do with uh, how can i make a living out of the education that i actually really got through uh dialing up i think uh in 2003 is when i graduated out of iit bombay which where i did my communication design uh and i think that was a turning point for me because i started looking at uh design from a very different perspective okay not from a perspective of a, of having a job uh but from a perspective that uh there's an there's an ability there's an ability or kind of a uh, skill that i have acquired to be able to change my status quo uh, to a much bigger one uh i never went into a job scenario i started my company uh, primarily because i think uh i think nobody was giving me a job good enough uh, for me to give up like you know give up my dream of being an entrepreneur uh, the jobs were very very uh, poorly paid so for me to give up a job was very easy at that point of time unlike in today's times when you are offered like uh, six figure salaries right as at the at the, at the go when you come out of the college so for me it was much easier journey to start my entrepreneurship journey but i think uh, i was motivated enough because uh the the whole program the whole program of communication design uh probably gave me that confidence that this is a this is a this is a profession where you don't need a godfather okay you don't need a a person to uh, really uh, or work under organization it is a profession which can can if be led by yourself uh and and that actually was i would say a turning point from their point that point onwards i have not looked back 
uh it has always been obviously it has not been all rosy as such but it always been i would say rewarding when it comes to me thinking about me as a designer yeah i thought that i didn't get a job at the campus interview and there was a reason and i'm proud of that reason whatever that reason might be uh i being not allowed or why being not capable enough to join tcs as a it engineer uh was probably one of the biggest turning points or biggest boon in my life i would say nice nice uh, and i always inspiring uh, to go back to your story um i think for me the the biggest thing was when i realized i didn't have to grow up um if i were to was to stay in design because uh there there are these moments where you have done a bunch of work and you are um you know whether it's presenting to a ceo of the world's largest bank or um any such organization etc you realize the power of naivety right at idea we used to use this uh, phrase called cultivated naivety right or you know where uh, some people call it beginner's mind you know there's buddhist zen philosophy and all of that um but the ability to maintain your childlike uh curiosity is not just i mean it's imperative in design you cannot lose it i feel if you're a true designer you cannot lose it uh, you have to hold on to it and piggybacks on something every one of the panelists have said then i you mentioned the inquisitiveness etc this thing that kids do right which drives you nuts which is ask you why 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 right and you know uh, and uh, it's literally one of you know uh, the thousands of design tools that we have at our disposal of you know asking the five whys even the business consultants teach it in business school right so not giving that up uh, when i realized that um we can be naive in that deliberate way and think from first principles and realize that that is not the norm uh in the industry <laughs> right a uh, lot of people uh, are just doing things because it's the default because they have been asked to do it right but if you can ask why if you can figure out um the real reasons or at least three or four levels beyond who who knows what real is right uh, but three or four levels down from what the default is what the norm is what the status quo is going back to our first question discussion i think um, that is incredibly powerful right and you might be an amazing entrepreneur like uh, tanais or you might be an amazing academic uh, like the panelists um, in a, you know at your side or um, you know you can be stumbling around in uh, in in various parts of the world but uh, i think it's an incredibly powerful realization for folks to realize hey um, this is a different kind of way of living life uh, and working where they don't have to be separate i never have to feel like hey i needed hobbies outside of work because you are using your whole brain and you're expected to in your work um you know obviously you can have hobbies i, I see the easel behind then i uh, <laughs> sitting, sitting there and all kind and guitars and what kind of what not but um i've just felt that it's it requires you to bring your whole self to work and the realization and when i was doing that in a very alien environment i grew up in india i was 25 when i moved to the us but um you know uh, i've seen ceos of very large companies who are supposed to be very hard edged individuals actually get emotional and cry when we are actually bringing the stories of their customers and real life to them right so um those moments of realizing that uh, you have incredible tools just as a human being and as a designer um was uh, the most influential to me thank you uh, so one last question to the panel uh, and uh, this is again uh, all right i'll let you put the question instead so what next as a frontier in design design practice design research what 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 do you look forward to or most excited about as going forward in design as a field we'll start with king shoots we'll go the other way around again oh great give me the hard questions i think <laughs> um <laughs> you wanted it isn't it <laughs> yeah i know yeah yeah so i'll i'll just you know there's a the people have talked on this panel about systems methodology uh and to me it's not a new direction but an old direction that has still not prevalent enough and that's why i to me that continues to be a lifelong mission uh, and it just has become more important now with uh, you know there's a 
I'm here in Silicon Valley. There's a Mark Andreessen famous quote of software eating the world. Um, literally, software is eating the world, uh, has eaten it, and it's like regurgitating it right now in pre-digested form. And uh, the algorithm's influence in our lives is more than ever. So as we, you know, as human beings, as uh, societies, we, we have been outsourcing for the last, you know, uh, a few hundred years, right? Uh, we're outsourcing every sense of the world. We're outsourcing manufacturing to other parts of the world. We are outsourcing services. We're outsourcing white color work. We are now outsourcing to technology. And we're giving away the crown jewels in terms of uh, reading, writing, thinking, the things that we think are core to being humans. We are now turning more and more over to the algorithm in order to maybe save a few bucks here and there, right? But what we're losing, I think, is the our ability to think in terms of systems, whether it's from an engineering standpoint or from a uh, design standpoint. And um, I would love to continue to uh, make that uh, a core human skill, like literacy, like numeracy, and all of that, which I don't think, honestly, is taught uh, outside of uh, certain very, very specific programs around the world. So. Uh, that move towards thinking in systems and seeing the world as malleable and something that is designed rather than something that is default handed to us is um, a challenge that in the age of AI uh, will be a very, very interesting challenge for us. And uh, part of it will be uh, well, partly toolifying a lot of work we do so that we can systematize and turn it into AI, but also uh, the rest of it will be about how do we augment our actual human capabilities rather than uh, giving away the crown jewels, so to speak. Cool. What next? I think, I think it, it defies the question that you started uh, the first the first question. Okay, we don't know what next. Okay, and that, that's the beauty of if, if we knew what next, then we would have actually we've been very prepared and then kind of really acted upon things. Uh, very systematically uh, to solving it, so we don't know what next. Uh, I think I'm I'm equally excited about uh, what King should King should mention. I think it, the, the first thing when he said what next and that 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 whole the whole outsourcing of tech to technology, we being outsourced to technology is something that is uh, bothering, exciting. Uh, I don't know if it's negative, positive, but it's I think uh, at 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 a at a cusp where uh, it can. It has an it it has it's showing us uh, a direction which probably we had not kind of really actively thought of as such. Uh, uh, saying that, I think we humans have uh, always been uh, doing this. Okay, we have been trying to kind of create problems for ourselves, trying to solve it, and in turn, kind of really creating more problems to solve for ourselves. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, it would be interesting to ask chat GPT to be able to really say what next in design. I would like to hear the answer from it. Uh, and maybe uh, it can give us some clues around as such. But but I think the whole outsourcing of ourselves to technology uh, is going to really push us as human beings uh, to a different level. I think we have not kind of really even got to uh, even experience that right now. Uh, and not only from an innovation perspective or freeing up our minds from uh, doing mundane things and trying to put the new things, I think it's pushes, pushing us to our new sociological boundaries as well. I think the societies will change at the back of what we're trying to do here. Uh, the language in which we are communicating is going to change at the back of what, what's happening in the world of technology. Okay, uh, I always am very, very, I'm very excited about uh, the, the whole science of language, okay, linguists. Okay, the way we are going to really communicate in the way technology is trying to generalize and trying to put us in the one umbrella. And we are all seeing the same thing today. Uh, art out of mid journey done by a person in India or in US or in Germany probably has a similar kind of light, uh, light and a kind of texture to it. Okay, as opposed to an artist from India, an artist from US, an artist from Germany probably will render a particular thing in their own way. Uh, I think there is a new there's a new kind of umbrella which is getting formed and I am very excited to really see how this is going to change the language in which we are speaking to each other. Uh, let's see, let's see. I have uh, 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 one thing is for sure that uh, uh, a lot of things that we actually have uh, very set patterns for is going and we still feel that that is skill 
uh, and that is skill kind of really associated with it, I think will go out of fashion and definitely their new skills or new kind of really uh, areas of our brain, which is going to get triggered to do things. But I don't know, yeah, the answer is uh, the answer is very, very ambiguous, as ambiguous as what we have been trying to define since the start of the session. So. Well, if you want the shortest answer, ditto, ditto, right? Uh, but, but, but then, you know, to add my two cents to this, um, see, uh, it is not for the first time that something like this has happened in the world, right? After every uh, uh, sort of like the even the first industrial revolution, people were asking, well, uh, I uh, what do I do with my bullock cart, right? And it takes a little bit of time, but um, you know we redefine work, right? We we and based on how we redefine work, we also redefine what we learn in order to do the work. That is the skill part of it. Okay, so both the educational as well as the industrial side are gradually going to change. I, I don't think that you know there's any denying that. Okay, the question is how. I do think that this is an era of the designer. The reason is that. Uh, regardless of what technology can do right now, it does not yet have intent. The designer does. Okay, so I think that uh, uh, a, a, there is always a great responsibility on the designer's shoulder to uh, say that this is what needs to be done. Okay, uh, things like AI may give you data uh, based on which they may give you a heuristic sense uh, of uh, what needs to be done and so forth. But there is something to be said about understanding the world around you and coming up with uh, opportunities to uh, uh, overcome or rather tackle, right? So from that perspective, I'm not at all afraid uh, of, of chat GPT or whatever it is, right? We are going to figure out uh, how or what else we will do, right? Uh, being creative is our thing, okay? So, uh, I think I'm fine with the current situation regarding that. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, if you want another short answer, it will be I don't know, which was already said also. But I think, as I said, uh, saying something about future is very difficult. Nevertheless, I have a view uh, in, in the sense that, or an observation looking at technology and society uh, altogether, that tools and technology will keep on evolving. That That is naturally the course of human development and how we have evolved or even life on Earth has evolved that way, yeah. But uh, the as we, in recent social structures, if you look at it, there is a lot more division, polarization, which is coming in. And also a lot of society is being left behind, which was previously also the case, but maybe increasingly more now. Maybe as a designer, we had to think, how can we intervene to take everybody along? Uh, th that question should also be asked. That's only one of the many questions which can be asked. And tools and technology, AI, all that will keep on developing, and th those are things which we can use. But the question is, as a society, are we able to think together uh, to be inclusive of people who are not represented in the in the data sets who are not having access to the technology and maybe as designers we need to think of those solutions as well this is slightly different perspective but hopefully that's useful as well all right thank you uh, this has been a wonderful session uh, we're not closing it yet but i'll still given that the panel discussion part of it is done i would like to thank the panelists yeah, okay. for this uh, very uh, yeah uh, I would like to just share a, a very small story before you actually end the session, okay? On the, on the light of how communities actually are being left behind or have a different uh, perspective. I was I was in Manali actually some time back, and I was at the village at 13,000 feet, okay? And uh, I was actually looking for some authentic food uh, around that particular place. And uh, I just, there was an old gentleman, uh, sitting down uh, under a tree and I was like sketching there. I used to do, I, I was sketching there and I just asked that, hey, uh, I saw khana, original khana kaha milega? 
okay and he actually i thought a re- i will get a response which was kind of going to be like yeah this is what it is but i got a response which was filled with anger and angst okay and he was saying that the from the time when till maggi was invented in india okay it has spoiled all the authentic food in the hills okay the only thing that you find in the hills today is maggi and all varieties of maggi <laughs> okay and i don't know where uh, why did i tell the story but it's it's about you know how we are losing out on certain aspects because of certain development around i mean it's just typically in food okay like yeah you can cook maggi in 2 minutes you can cook it it can be delivered anywhere in the mountains if you go even in the base camp everest base camp you can still get maggi okay uh and it's destroying a lot of kind of so he was very angry about that he cannot provide me with any food other than mangi but and he was not very kind of kind about it so yeah i mean i think let's look at how how we are able to as designers affect communities rather than just kind of look at technology you know yeah manish you have yeah i think goes back to what uh, kishu was talking about as well that systems point of view right it's uh, yeah. eventually yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think just in the interest of time, I'll sort of uh, thank the panelists. It was a very enriching discussion. Uh, the session is not done yet because we have our uh, some of them at least uh, alumni from uh, the 13th batch. So all those who are here in person, please raise your hands. I can see a couple of them in front, or at least one, two, only two of you. All right. Two are here. One is online. So Himansh, Himanshu, please come on camera. and given that you are the only one online so i'll ask you to uh, talk about yourself so what have you been doing since you graduated your journey so if you can sort of run through good evening, good evening. and say hi, hello to everyone here yes yes please go ahead yeah hi everyone good evening and uh, uh, thank you for great insights panelists and everybody else uh, i am actually working in despenia i'm leading this design studio for last couple of years and uh, i am uh currently uh heading the industrial design and all the design aspects of desmenia what has been going on from desmenia and hearing from the panelists what all uh, inputs they are giving i think they are right on point and whatever is applicable abroad and in india and in different domains like ui ux it's also applicable on the product design part so i'm actually glad that i was part of this com- like this panel discussion throughout and thank you for providing me opportunity to speak here we manchu you guys need to drop by uh, at cpdm sometime right if now yeah. and then that's you need we need to change into uh, some sort of uh, sort of pilgrimage right uh, annual visits yeah i'm planning to actually i'm just planning the how i can do collaborations with the design institute as well and soon i'll be speaking to them sure sure great great listening to you guru thank you everyone <clears throat> hello thank you thank you sir son right yeah, yeah okay son. so uh, my name is guru prasad and uh, i didn't okay I'll, i'll give you the other one i think this is hello i can some reason louder. Louder. Okay, louder thank you We're speaking of wicket problems from <laughs> the start of this session there been so many wicket problems i hope i don't get caught in no get caught into one uh so hi i am hi all i am guru prasad uh i am from batch 2009 11 i came to know only today that it's 13th batch so 9 11 and 13th both are unlucky <laughs> but but thankfully my life hasn't been unlucky uh, one of the best uh, moments two years uh, has been in cpdm and i'm very very grateful for that iac so i i'm very proud to be a cpdm iacian uh i thank all the professors here who have been great uh, gurus here design gurus and i also thank all of my uh, batchmates it had uh, to make the two years pretty fun and uh, I, uh, i also came to know later after uh, two years of cpdm that my friend vinay's batchmate is also my relative so <laughs> so so it's been crazy uh, uh, mdes so i believe mdes uh, stands for master of destiny we all have uh, to create our destinies here and uh, cpdm especially is a center for uh, center for people's uh, this, uh, people 
people's uh, dreams manifestation. Center for people's dream manifestation. CPDM. <laughs> because I, whatever I dreamt uh, in my uh, bachelor's to be in an aerospace and to be uh, uh, in that stream, it became possible once I did my MDES. Because I, as uh, the three panelists, I'm also an ar architect. And uh, architect is one of the minorities here. Who are the architects here? <laughs> oh, great. I, it's, it's because Loni. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I know there's been a lot of uh, dif difficulties here because most of them are mechanical. I, I was the only architect of my batch. So, <laughs> so uh, coming to the question, uh, how has been my journey? It has been as uh, the name of our moderator, Vishal. So, <laughs> it's been <laughs> Vishal, the breadth which I have uh, gone through uh, all these uh, 12 years, or rather 14 years, 2009, the design journey started, uh, has been uh, ups and downs. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride because I joined uh, after campus placement here in Tech Mahindra, a service company, and uh, the breadth of uh, experience and exposure I got there uh, at, as a service company, uh, aerospace, uh, product design in uh, uh, this one, like locomotive design with Alstom, Airbus, Boeing. So, so many um, uh, clients uh, I got exposed to. And uh, after that, I joined the PhD program here at IAC. And uh, also, I have, uh, as uh, Vinayak, he, he, he's also like, um, um, what do you call, department mate. Because <laughs> we, we were contemporaries. He, when he was doing uh, his uh, research, I was here. I joined as a uh, MDES. Uh, so as he mentioned, uh, the law and uh, policy. So I joined in public policy also, and I'm doing right now law. So it's crazy. It's uh, I'm in the second year law, LLB. So uh, so I mean the exposure uh, which I, I as a designer uh, in a law mm, field, I'm getting to perceive so many problems which the law has. And as uh, you very well pointed out, the system thinking needs to be there. Like there needs to be. Um, we have to break barriers. We have to uh, not. Uh, curtail ourselves as designers we are everywhere we are masters of destiny to change the world thank you good evening okay yeah so very good evening to everyone uh, so so myself Vinay, and uh, so i like yeah so i graduated i think 12 years back but i never left this place i've been here and then most of you guys would have seen me uh, so post my <laughs> masters, uh, like I was working with uh, Mahindra and Mahindra for a very short span, and uh, and then I joined LNT and then I started the industrial design department there, which was not there, and uh, I quit that, and then I again joined under Professor Sen. So where we were working on the prosthetic arm um, uh, Purak. So I think uh, I worked under him for almost uh, three and a half years. Here, okay, <laughs> maybe I'll fix it with the. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is better. <laughs> yeah, so then uh, we launched a company uh, in 2019, uh, Grass Bionics Private Limited. Uh, so uh, uh, we have been, I'll say, doing okay, okay. And now uh, I, I will put that in a second track. So we are not able to do very good business out of it. So now I joined the company. And uh, so the challenge, what I faced, I'll tell you. See, uh, like uh, as a fresher, when you join a company, right? So the company, all the companies may not know like what designers are capable of. So you have to go there, you have to establish yourself, and then you have to take opportunity, and then you have to prove that. So I think I got that opportunity with LMT, and then I was able to do the same thing with Professor Sen. And even in my company, I was able to because no one is there, so we have to take care. Now I, again, I'm restarting it again. So I joined a company which works in the energy sector. I think it's called Enphase Energy. So I think now I'm trying to stabilize myself and then slowly I'll be able to uh, contribute to that. And yeah, it was a wonderful journey and uh, happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, so as he suggested, as he was telling you, like, so we are traveling to, uh, I think, Jaipur. Eh? Okay. Jaipur. So uh, myself and one of our friends, Maraj, we were traveling to Jaipur and then, so we were casually we were discussing. So then I figured out that he's one of my distant cousin, cousin brother. <laughs> Which I was not aware. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you all. So. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, one more. Thing. Yeah. Currently, I'm also uh, sorry. I didn't fill up uh, the latest role. I, I told you, you know that it's Vishal. So the latest role which I'm doing is uh, visiting faculty at uh, the Anand Sagar uh, Vidas, uh, sir, with uh, Ranjan and uh, uh, Pravin Uchil, sir. So thank you. I'm taking materials design, SVK, sir, of course. Of course. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So that was wonderful. I think. Uh, with that, we are coming to the sort of closing session. So, uh, for the online speakers, your set, I mean, your uh, so the idea here, as I said, is that we are sort of celebrating 100 design ambassadors. So, all of you, the panelists, are our design ambassadors. Uh, and of course, we'd like to sort of uh, give you mementos and certificates. Uh, for the two of you, you'll have to come down to CPDM at some point to get yours, right? <laughs> Uh, and for those who are here, we are going to give it right now. Uh, we can, yeah, we can discuss that later. But would love to have you here in person at some point uh, and have longer sessions. Uh, so we'll start and uh, do the closing ceremony. So if you could just bear with us for another three, four minutes. Manish. Okay, I have the most pleasant duty now, and uh, just just to show everyone, just for the that uh, hopefully you are going to get one of those, and we would <laughs> like to actually see you here. So I hope one day you are able to come. But this is not contingent upon that. <laughs> you have your certificate no matter what. But we love you. Thank you, guys. Uh, so I will uh, start with Professor Manish, my colleague, and. So this is, as you know, CBDM 25. Well, yes, speaking without the mic, so I'll bring it here. Okay. So CBDM 25 memento, and uh, this is the uh, you, you you are now a certified ambassador of CBDM. So <laughs> of your happy to take that role. Yes. Thank you. And then the same for you, Greg. Now that you are here, all the way from the US, you do get your certificate and also, also your memento. So that's your memento, and that's your certificate. Thank you. Thank you. So that's one way of sneaking into the photograph, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, so thank you, everyone. I think with that, we'll close it here. Thanks everyone who joined us online and special thanks to King Shook especially for waking up this early on a Monday morning. So thank no you all. Yeah. So you have a good time. Thank you guys. Thank you. And of course, let's not forget Professor Vishal and his team for uh, continuing to organize this event. Thank you once again. <laughs> See you tonight. Yeah. See you. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Manchu. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. It was wonderful. Yes. Great to have you. So you're around.